Hey, welcome back to the Purpose of a Profit podcast. Uh, this week, I'm really excited to have Lauren from the Food Empowerment Project, a guest that I've been excited to get on the podcast for a good number of months after reading Conscious Capitalism uh, by Whole Foods, and Lauren popped up in there, and I've got a note in my book just now to say, who is this person? Please figure that out. So, Lauren, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Hi, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Fantastic. And I guess for our listeners who don't know what the Food Empowerment Project is, would you mind giving them a bit of an idea of what what it actually is and what it does? Absolutely. So Food Empowerment Project is the vegan food justice organization. And our goal is to really educate people about the ways that their food choices are connected. And it's connected maybe locally, but it's also connected globally. And to try to give people tools to make a difference to have a positive impact on the world, whether that be the environment, non-human animals or human animals. And we focus on veganism for the animals. Uh, We work on farm worker justice and we work to try to get people not to buy chocolate sourced from the worst forms of child labor, including slavery. And we work on what we call food apartheid, which are areas where black, brown, indigenous and immigrant communities are majorly impacted by lack of access to healthy foods. So that is a bit what we do. We want to help people to what we call eat their ethics. And I know you guys are based out west in, in California. California, that's right. So, yes, you, so we're, uh, we're recording this. It's, it's early morning for you guys. We're, we're in the afternoon at the moment. Um, how far is your, is your reach at the moment? Like how, I know you're in touch with areas across like globally. I've seen your, your recent wrap-up video uh, for 2021. Um, yeah, how far does your reach go? Well, we're international in the sense of our reach. And a lot of that is because I have spoken in different places around the world, yeah. but also because a lot of people are interested in, you know, making sure that their food choices aren't harming others. So things like our chocolate list is in English, Spanish, Portuguese, German, and I think French now, um, because people around the world are looking for ways to buy chocolate that isn't sourced from, you know, places that don't meet their ethics. Our our work on um, farm worker justice and uh, far, uh, sorry, uh, food apartheid is more localized because our work tends to be to try to have an impact locally. And of course, our our message holistically, I think, is something that a lot of people have been looking for of the vegan and animal rights movement for a long time, and that's one that embraces. Um, various forms of injustices and pulls them together and literally tries to take them apart and figure out ways to to be better. Yeah, it made it made me think a lot about what you mentioned the phrase there, food apartheid. And I've never heard it before, but you know, naturally, this idea of segregation, this kind of hierarchy in place between those that have access to being able to, um, you know, be empowered with food and the choices that they make, and those that 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 can't. I mean, you think in Maslow's hierarchy, it's the right, I need food to survive and it's sustenance first and foremost. But I think there's so much of us in the Western world that have evolved beyond that. But if I try, if I push my trolley past the food bank station in the supermarket that's got, you know, tins of spaghetti hoops or, you know, just really low lacking nutritious sort of foods, even, even out with kind of going to, you know, a level of being vegan or dairy free, et cetera. Um, there is such a mix and such a social inequality element to, I guess, what do we put into our bodies first and foremost? Absolutely. Unfortunately, you know, eating healthy has become a privilege instead of a right. You know, that that um, if you, and we're talking about communities that literally have more liquor stores and fast food in their areas, and they don't have the ability to buy fresh foods and the fresh foods that may be available may be too expensive for them because they aren't making a living wage. Or because it's, you know, it's going to take so much time for them to cook it, but maybe they're working several jobs in order to keep a roof over their family's head. So, you know, these are problems that are unfortunately all over the world. You know, it's not just the United States. It's not just Europe. It's happening in Australia um, and other places around the globe. And, you know, I think that many people, because we kind of live in our own bubble, don't understand what it's like for anybody else. And that's really interesting because we even had a uh, Dory Tunstall, Dean Dory, on uh, recently, and she talked about design anthropology, but decolonizing design because she's all about working with the indigenous people in the area to kind of bring back design that's relevant. And I thought that was quite relevant as well when I looked at your statement about environmental racism. 
about how that works when you look at where the slaughterhouses or the pig farmers are around where, where not is, ethnic minorities are black or whatever, and the, the danger it gives them as well to do with the health issues. I think you mentioned there was the highest rates of asthma and nausea and all this really shocking stuff. And even I heard a really heartwarming, but at the same time quite shocking statement around the chocolate aspect where somebody who worked in the, I can't remember if you call it the chocolate farms, I don't know what you call it exactly, but he mentioned that eating chocolate is like eating my flesh. I've seen that statement, and that really was quite a horrific, but eye-opening statement as well. And that's what got me looking at the issue. You know, I've been vegan since 1988. I, you know, it's what who I am. It's what I believe in the empathy that I have. And when I read that statement from that former slave, uh, and, sorry, formerly enslaved person, um, they were saying something that I would imagine a non-human animal saying too. And I just thought, you know, I can't look at chocolate the same anymore. You know, this is, this is a product of suffering, um, which is why I went vegan. So I didn't participate in that suffering. And so um, the chocolate issue, you know, for me, I learned about it in the early 2000s and, you know, felt it was imperative that it be part of Food Empowerment Project's work. I think as well, when you look at the issues you guys cover as well, and if you ever go on the Food Empowerment website, which I uh, recommend you do, and you click on the, the tab issues, I was amazed at about how bread, the breadth of what you do, obviously you do deal with the sea animals as well, obviously people make pescatarian, might not consider them a non-living element, when they actually are completely, you've got the environmental stuff. Stuff. You talk about slavery, you talk about food choices. The breadth is, is so vast. And is that was that set out at the start or is that just grown over time as you became more aware of these issues? It's grown over time and it's still growing. Um, we have hopefully later this year, we'll be putting out a page about avocados. You know, I mean, the world is consistently changing, right? And we feel that our work has to represent that that a lot of people wanna make sure that they're eating their ethics, that they're not contributing to something that they don't harm, that they don't wanna to contribute to. So we have to keep up our information. You know, when we first started, you know, it was like the reality of how connected everything is. Like, oh my gosh, well, we, we have to talk about restaurant workers. How can we not talk about them when we're talking about food? And then learning more about colonization and how dairy is a legacy of colonization and, and the need to talk about that. So, you know, we get, I get a lot of pushback jokingly, of course, from my crew that, you know, our website keeps growing, but, you know, we, we owe it to ourselves and we owe it to people who care about these issues to keep informed as much as possible. And even just as importantly, to keep ideas on what people can do to make a difference. Yeah. And I, I suppose it's a real danger, isn't it? You know, when you're seeing an issue, when you start, when you start kind of uncovering issues, these different layers of whether it's kind of social inequality, uh, you know, poverty, um, you know, slavery, all of these things. And there's a whole host of health benefits here we're talking about and ecological issues. Is there a danger, I guess, in trying to fix everything? Is there a like, clear priority in your mind of like what do you what your mission is to kind of focus on or is it it's kind of everything on the table it's a great question um and i think it's one that people struggle with a bit right because it you know people can feel overwhelmed by it 100 percent. i was gonna that's the word i was gonna use i wrote here <laughs> like I, I i feel that in myself you know yeah i've moved to vegan veggie and I've, I've i still eat the odd bit of fish as well and I, I just want to do my bit wherever I see, but at, at the same time, I kind of feel overwhelmed. So I'm really glad you've said that <laughs> for me, but 100%. No problem. I always ask people to use that uh, O as opportunity. It's our opportunity to help create change, right? And I don't want people to be overwhelmed by it, but I do want them to look at the opportunities they have to make a difference in their own lives but also in the lives of others. So, you know, for Food Empowerment Project, we may have this overwhelming, you know, amount of information on their website. And it may be something that I personally adhere to, but we literally only have four programmatic areas, which is veganism, chocolate, farm worker justice, and um, access to healthy foods. So, but we put that information out there because we know that if you care about some of these other issues, you're gonna care about these too. And we're not actively working on, but we wanna provide the information for those people who want to know more and who want to do better. But, you know, I just, I'm always hopeful that people can try to look at it as opportunity that like there's so much suffering and pain in this world, but wow, with my food choices, something that I do, if I have the privilege of doing it 
at all, much less one, two, three times a day, there's a lot of responsibility with that. And with that responsibility, you have to have more information. And so we want people to have as much information as possible to make informed decisions. And so we feel like, you know, we want people to be thinking about these things because too much these days, it seems that no one's really thinking about the consequences of their decisions. How big is that? I know you talk about the information you've got on your website. Me and Chris were chatting just before you came on. How big is an issue is misinformation? Um, you know, touch on a couple of things, even over the last few years that support a lot of the message. Sea spiracy, uh, you know, singularly, you know, reduced consumption of fish. No one's talking about it and we absolutely should do, but actually undermines a lot of this single use plastic and this focus that we have on reducing single use plastics across the world and saying, actually, that's a side issue. That's that's not even that important. We should just be not eating not eating fish or reducing consumption of fish um, and things like that that you would think are really supporting your uh, ecological issue, supporting, I guess, you know, animal rights. This is and, and even the social inequality that goes on. There's still these there's an agenda there, a primary agenda there for these type of, um, you know, shows or documentaries or articles that come out and it does feel a lot confusing from the outside kind of looking in to try and understand what's true what's right um like how do you how do you manage that well it's another really good question i mean in that i mean the thing that comes hard with that is that i always want people to to try to do something right i mean the, the way especially when you look at the oceans i mean we all have to do something i mean it is dire right now when we look at our planet so Anything that anybody can do is, in my opinion, is a good thing. Now, is it enough? Is there more that people can do? Absolutely. Um, but I think when it comes to data, um, we go to the original source. Um, in fact, there was a study that we put out on our webpage that was talking about like, you know, a massive amount of pollution in the oceans being from fishing gear, right? And we had that information, we put it out and the scientist reached out to us and said, well, actually that's, that's when you look in, I'm very bad with numbers, but it was kind of like, no, that is the mass amount when you look at this proportion of it. And I was like, okay, well, we need to change our information then because we have a scientist reaching out to us who works on this issue. And when you read the, the quote, you could see how it could be confusing. And in my opinion, even small numbers are devastating, right? I can use the dairy industry's numbers, I can use uh, the US's Environmental Protection Agency numbers, I can use the quote unquote beef industry's numbers, and there's still devastating amounts of resources being used to, to for people to raise and kill animals for food or to devastate our oceans. You know, I can use their direct numbers. So there's no, you know, there may be question about their authenticity, but if they're trying to use the lowest number possible, it's still too great a number. So a lot of times we'll be like, well, then let's just use industry's numbers because they're still bad. You know, there's only so much they can hide. But, you know, we try to get to the original. We always, I should say, get to the original sources. We don't rely on, you know, even within our guidelines as an organization, we really don't rely on other animal organizations or anything like that, unless it's talking about the suffering of the animals, because we want to be sure that we have the most accurate information, because the last thing we need is somebody questioning our credibility just because of a number when the just the, the everything that we're saying it should be more important than one number on our webpage. I absolutely love that because that, that takes me into the story around how, as mentioned at the start, how it came about your name from the Whole Foods book as well and how you were personally called out in that because during a picketing line, I think it was, it was John McKay, is it McKay, mentioned that uh, you challenged him on basically the numbers of, he said he good animal welfare, the best in the United States at that, that point. You challenged them. You said, "No, in fact, this isn't true. I, I need to show you some stats and some figures here." So it shows that by you doing that, you helped improve what Whole Foods were doing as a whole, and they found themselves became vegan. So it just shows you got that kind of connection between you're putting out information, and then the the scientists coming back to you to say that's actually a little bit skewed. Let's fix that. Fix that. And you've done the same with Whole Foods. You're not afraid to challenge the big companies as well, but take advice and do that for yourself. And I love as well that the concept around we need to change our our kind of emotional connection to animals as well, because why is it that we might have pets like dogs and cats, we'll treat them differently to pigs and cows when we can see that 
dogs and cats may have a personality, but we might not assume that cows have a personality or a pig when actually that is the case. And I think that's probably a bit of an educational piece that as a society we need to get to as well. Yeah, and I think it's a matter of we don't spend that amount, same amount of time with chickens. We don't spend that same amount of time with sea creatures, you know, but once you start to watch them, you start, I mean, I have a, a bunny, um, which we, my husband and I found on the street downtown, brought him into our home and I'm used to having cats and to watch his little personality. Like I don't, you know, part of my heart doesn't think I could have handled knowing this when I primarily focused on animal experimentation because I can see his gestures and his movements and everything he does that now if I see an images of a rabbit in the lab, like I don't, I know him, I know rabbits more now and it would just destroy me um, because I know him. Um, but yeah, I think we just haven't had the opportunity. And, and just to go back on the Whole Foods thing is that one of the other things was when we did our investigations of where Whole Foods Market and other grocery store chains were getting um, their duck meat, if we had exaggerated at all what it was that we found in there, we would have lost all credibility because when they went in, they turned around and said, we're seeing exactly what you said you saw, right? So if we had exaggerated, if we had said anything, they wouldn't have trusted us. They wouldn't have believed us. And so I'm very much about we have to be, you know, it's so important for us. Our message is very, very simple, right? It's about not wanting to harm another living being. It's not controversial. It's not that hard to grasp. It's very simple. But because people need more and we want to give people more of an understanding because everybody's different, everybody's going to be reached um, and, and touched in different ways. We do want to find that information, but for the most part, for a lot of us, it's just very simple, not wanting to cause harm. Yeah, and there's something there's something really, like as you said, simple in that, yes, there's lots of information around and it can be confusing, but it often, listening to you, it's very intuitive, at least it was for me making a decision. I think I never, I've never had a dog before, never had a pet before, and I think as soon as I had a pet, who's now named, I named our business after, <laughs> it's never... Uh, you know, it was a kind of growing realization, actually, in terms of you no, know, this is that this is animal life, and it felt intuitive to me that my values had completely shifted, and therefore I, I needed to make some better choices. So even with, I guess, all the different Im like information or misinformation that's out there, coming back to what you'd said originally, doing choosing to do something positive, yeah, a step in the right direction, and often you don't need a lot of information for that. You can look with your own eyes and feel with your heart and and make that choice exactly exactly and what, what else can people do then as, as individuals and obviously we're business owners as well is there something that business owners can do and individuals can do in their, in their own life that can help them make an impact not just to themselves and their, their health and well-being but as society as a whole yeah i think that business owners you know well, oh, there's a lot you can do, right? And I know it's tough, right? Like I started Food Empowerment Project with nothing. You know, we started in 2007. I didn't start getting $1,000 a month until 2013. So we were run as all volunteers. It wasn't until 2016 till we hired our first full-time employee. So, you know, we grew small. And one of the reasons why we grew small is because I couldn't afford to pay people a living wage and cover their insurance. You know, and I think that for me, that was inherently part of the organization. I couldn't be like, well, these people love the organization. I can pay them little, you know, it was like, no, I have ethics. I have a responsibility. So I think that making sure that you're not growing so fast that you're not paying your employees, right, is one thing. And I think that whatever it is, if you're producing, you know, which I feel like most people to one degree or another, because I don't know your business, this is hard to say, but it's to really be responsible for where you're getting your product from, who's responsible for it, and how are they being treated? Because you all hold tremendous amount of power. And I know it's harder for smaller business owners, right? I used to work in um, trying to get electronics to have less um, you know, chemicals in them and also the end of use to have recycling and things like that. And we'd hear from the smaller companies like, hey, we don't, you know, it's the big companies because they purchase so much that have more power. But I think that the more that we try to everybody, you know, chip away and like, hey, we do care about how this is being uh, manufactured. We do care about this and putting it out to their customers as well to try to make a difference, I think is really important. I think individually, you know, with everything we purchase, we have to feel some responsibility. And I mean that 
more for those of us who are more privileged to make these decisions. You know, just as much time as we spend looking into the best computer or the best, you know, kitchen appliance or something like that, we need to take as much time into looking at how um, how the workers are treated. And, you know, and I and get, get this part right. Like I have an I have a phone, right? I have a cell phone, and all the companies, all the electronics companies, are responsible for some pretty horrific stuff, right? But then my responsibility shifts. These are now part of necessity. So I make sure to reach out to the companies and say, I hope that you have a take back and responsible recycling policy. I hope that you're not shipping these electronics overseas. I hope that you're trying to reduce the amount of chemicals in your electronics products. So just trying to figure out ways to make a difference in the purchases that I make. And it's, it's not always easy, right? Like I'm not gonna act like, oh, I do it every time I buy something. I do my best though. And I think that that's what the world needs of us. And I have to say that the younger generation right now is superb with all of this. I mean, they are, they are everything right now. They are really gonna change our world even more um, impressively than they, are, than they already have. And I think as well, I mean, honestly, Lauren, that is lovely to hear, especially the last bit, because my daughter is eight now, and she had a presentation to do on the slave trade. And in the group, and there's a WhatsApp group of all the parents, and there was some parents going, I can't believe she got to a presentation and really don't believe this, we're busy as it is. And somebody went back, yeah, as if there wasn't child labour slaves back then, we should actually work to improve. And, and now, somewhere. somewhere. And now, of course, yeah. Somewhere, yeah. So what we did is we spent time together, and it was a really eye-opening experience for myself. We spent time together, we researched it, we went into Glasgow, into the city, we looked at all the slave trade monuments, we understood where the, the Glasgow Museum of Art, that's a, from a previous slave trader, and we, we got to educate ourselves. And with COP26, that was in Glasgow as well, my daughter is just phenomenal. And you're right, I can see these people changing the world as well. And now we're making our food choices as well. Now she's wanting to become vegetarian, to eventually maybe move to vegan. So you can already see that step change. And we need to try and fix it, not for our generation or the next generation, it's the generations to come as well. well thank her so much. I mean, because literally that's it, right? And you as a parent is saying, it's okay to learn about this. You're not dismissing that. And I think that whatever it is about this, these younger generations, I'm a bit older, is just like this. It's not just a curiosity. It's a curiosity to create change. It's a curiosity to learn and not hide from the truth and figure out a ways to be better. And it's just, it's just incredible. Yeah, I, I think there is a, like listening to, to that and knowing what I've observed over the last couple of years and, you know, even politically, you know, it feels like certain movements, there's like a circling firing squad of like, you know, people trying to be ever more pure or more right about being the most ecological or, and I hope we keep, you know, that sense of curiosity and energy and enthusiasm, but that humility to kind of recognize we're all trying to move in the right direction. And no one's kind of on a pedestal, you know, compared to anyone else. We're, we've all got, you know, maybe slightly different um, agendas. You've just mentioned one there. There'll be someone out there who is hammering those tech companies to try and, you know, be far more ethically more produced. You're doing your, you know, you're doing way more than anyone else will be in, in your corner of the world. And I think that's absolutely you know, we just need to be keeping pushing people forward and praising them for the work that they're doing, not try to pull them down for what they're not, because we can't be all things to all people. Exactly. You know, and I get a question a lot, especially from students like, hey, if I want to go vegan, what what can I not eat first? And I'm like, whatever you're going to be successful at. <laughs> That's all I want. I want you to feel good about whatever it is that you're giving up and that you can do it so that you try to give up the next thing. You know, there's no like, this is what you should do. To me, it's about what, what you'll be successful at. So you feel good about what you're doing and show yourself you can do it. Well, I'm amazed as well, because obviously you mentioned, was it 1998 you went vegan? Is that right? I went vegan in 88. 88, sorry. 30, over 30 years, yeah. 35, yeah. 34 years. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, wow. back, back then it wasn't as widely known, I would imagine, or accepted. Whereas now there's so much choice out there, which is fantastic. I mean, there's no vegan but, stores or vegan smoothie shops or vegan oh, like I, cabinets in the supermarket yeah i i'm from texas originally and so i went vegan <laughs> in texas so probably everything you, you're thinking that you know about texas is probably true um, <laughs> i'm not offended i don't live there anymore um no yeah it was very hard um it was you know and now it's just amazing i mean we used to have to boil hot water to you know a dry um 
powder to create our veggie burgers, you know? <laughs> so it's just now you can buy veggie burgers. It's pretty amazing. I guess, is, there anything, is there anything about that, actually? That's more from a curiosity point of view. Um, like, do you ever dig into the likes of the vegetarian, like companies that are creating the vegetarian products and vegan products and what's in what's in them and how they're created? Do you, I guess, is that something you focus on at all? Um, we don't really focus on it. I mean, again, a lot of the chocolates um, that are on our list, recommended or not, may come from vegan chocolate companies. And we don't recommend, you know, to make our list, you have to at least make one vegan chocolate. But if you make all vegan chocolates, but you're still sourcing from areas where child labor and slavery are prevalent, you're still not going to make our recommended list. So it's, you know, it has to be both as far as we're concerned. Yeah. But we don't really focus on it. I mean, we don't support the vegan products that have been tested on animals. You know, we aren't, you know, really interested in the lab grown stuff that requires some part of an animal to be part of it because it's still harming non-human animals. So we don't really work on it, but we do, um, you know, I usually get asked about things like that. Yeah, I, I suppose my, my question wasn't even coming from the, it's like replicating, you know, like ethically you could say whatever ethic is but ethically sourced sort of meat and grown grown meat in a lab and stuff like that I guess I'm not even talking about that I guess the it's the it feels like some of the time I'll go out and make you know I'll get vegan sausages or vegan burgers like try to substitute meat into my diet in some way shape or form and actually it's like I'm, I'm maybe just taking on vegan fast food as opposed to actually right. nutritious nutritious food in general more fruit veg and Stuff what yeah. the body actually needs. What I was going to say is I was amazed as well because I work in brand as well, Lauren. So I work in brand strategy. So one of my clients recently was a vegan brand, Satan, Satan Food oh, yeah. Gluten. Uh, and I was amazed. It was an eye-opening experience when this person wanted no treat, no harm to happen to anyone that was involved in the process. Complete traceability. Nice. Really reduces CO2. So really a strong ethical brand. But what I realized working with them over time was their their enthusiasm gets sometimes dented slightly by what they wanted to do and what was possible because of transportation and where stuff had to come from and uh, using seaweed and stuff like that and about the process stuff went through. So even though that person had an idea, they knew it was going to take maybe at least five years, 10 years to get to exactly where they wanted to. So now in that journey of getting to that point, it sounds like with your organisation, it sounds like you guys, you guys had a great idea of what you wanted to stand up for given your history, which you can come on to. And then over time, it seems to have just translated into much more than that because you've seen wider issues. Yeah, very much so. And, you know, again, I think that that, you know, I'm going to be pretty transparent here. I think that, you know, my mindset on how things should and shouldn't be haven't always been right. You know, like I'm very much a, I want to hear from everybody on staff. I really, you know, want everybody to have a say. And in doing so, sometimes it makes things take longer to get done, you know, and so and I've stepped down as the executive director of the organization um, in January of 2020. Um, and so it's, it's made it easier because I can still do that, but at least an ED or my executive director or somebody can have that final say because my personality isn't conducive to running an organization. I'm like fundraising, I gotta do programs, you know, like everything, like I'm like, we can worry about that later. All they want to do is the work. So, you know, I had to realize that I wasn't the best person to run the organization. I think right there is the humility that I was talking about, that strength to be able to say, I don't have always have, I'm not always the right woman for the job, <laughs> you know, or that job, you know, and recognizing that there are other people that, that, that can kind of support you in that space. But yeah, that's exactly that humility where, you know, it's, it's recognizing what the mission is and what, what your role is in that mission. So you touched on there um, around this chocolate list. And I guess for, for those of us that are listening and, and don't understand this or haven't maybe checked out the website whilst you're listening to this, um, Food Empowerment Project has a list of chocolate suppliers. This is something Chris and I, well, we must have spoke about this three, four years ago. So we've come pretty late to the party. And what we were really surprised about, I guess, looking through the list, and you can explain it in a lot more detail than, than I can, but you've gone, it feels like to extraordinary, extraordinary lengths across countries globally that are on a list that you support. So they, they are, they're ethical suppliers from your criteria. Um, uh, they may well provide vegan chocolate, but as you've said, 
they are, you know, they are making uh, uh, the case for fair pay. They do not source their chocolate from, you know, areas that have got slave child child labor or slavery. Um, and there's just this massive list of ones that you've gone done the due diligence on and research on and went, uh, uh, even with certain certifications, even with some correspondence between companies, they don't make the list. So in the UK, I'm thinking companies like Cadbury's, Nestle, um, you know, even even I was reading something there around fair trades, you know, and around the price that farmers are getting paid. The new kid on the block that that's in every supermarket now with a lovely, you know, Willy Wonka um, cover on it, t- Tony's Chocolate Lonely, which we got us into, I think, supporting that brand through a TED Talk, I don't know how many years ago. Um, they don't make that list. So do you want to talk a little bit about that list, I guess, the work that's gone into it and, yeah, I guess what feels like some really tight criteria there that you've, <laughs> that you've got there to make it onto that list? Because we yeah. all love chocolate, don't we? But <laughs> I know, I usually have to start my talks reminding people that chocolate's a luxury and not as a necessity, even though it may not feel like that all the time. Um, but yeah, our chocolate list is um, pretty basic. I mean, companies need to make at least one vegan chocolate and yep. they need to not be sourcing their chocolate from areas where slavery and child labor take place. Unfortunately, the list doesn't include things like um, how all of their workers are treated, right? It's very specifically these two things. So we yep. do have a line crossed out of some companies like Amy's Kitchen, which is a company here in the US that sells, sells a bit in Europe, but we crossed a line through them right now because we've just found out that they're not treating their employees well here. So we do try to keep it as transparent as possible, but the list is broken down into chocolates that we recommend. Those that we don't recommend is pretty much the rest of the list, but we explain why we don't recommend them. We won't recommend them if they're still sourcing from areas where child labor and slavery are taking place, but maybe they have certifications, those that don't respond to us. Those that are horrific in my mind that claim it's proprietary information. And with that, I wanna remind you, we're not asking for the state or even the city or anything like that, we're literally asking for the country of origin and they claim it's proprietary, which is absurd. Um, But yeah, we are very, our our guidelines are strict. I mean, it's pretty basic to us that it's just, it's about where they're sourcing their cacao. And that's where it gets tricky because there are various certifications created by industry themselves or third-party certifiers. And what's happening right now in Western Africa is the problem is so bad there and so prevalent that the certifications are simply not working. You have people going into the farms and checking off things like, yes, their bathrooms are clean when they don't even have bathrooms. Yeah, I've seen that. You you only have a small percentage of the farms actually being investigated. You have people who are telling, you know, put the children somewhere else right now while the- Why why is that? Why is that happening on the ground when they're getting checked? You know, why is it happening on the ground? It's hard for me to say because I don't really know. I mean, I can have theories because of certifications out here where maybe they have a close relationship. The people who are doing the certifications maybe have a close relationship. And so they turned a blind eye or maybe the certifiers aren't really taking it as seriously. Um, I mean, why did this is happening for from the grower or from the people who are harvesting the cacao is pretty simple. They're not being paid a living income, you know, because Hershey or Cadbury or Mars, whoever wants that extra yacht or that extra house, instead of paying the people who are responsible for their livelihood, a living income. And that's why this is really happening is simply greed and people not wanting to to pay them what they should be paying. I mean, they're taking a natural resource out of Western Africa and they aren't being compensated, which continues to happen in places like Africa and Latin America and other places around the world. Um, So, you know, this is why we don't feel comfortable with the certifications. I mean, because they've been found, you know, when we first started out, when Food and Primer Project first created our list, we did go based on fair trade. We did go based on organic. But over time, we found that they were not working, that you had people, they were doing interviews with people. Actually, one of the reports from Sheffield, England was the most shocking um, that that the report came out and said, even in the co-op, Coapacoa, I don't know how to pronounce it. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
that their cacao, that even though it was partially owned by, by the people who doing the work, a lot of the people were interviewed knew nothing about this cooperative. So there's an inherent problem there when the people who are supposed to be a part of it don't even know about it. When you look at something like Tony Chocolonely, you know, I give Tony Chocolonely high marks in transparency. Absolutely. They just released a report saying that like what I think a thousand children were found working in their fields in the past month. I mean, the report that they just did, I give them high marks for transparency. But our list isn't based on transparency. Our list is based on the can they, are they doing a good enough job or not? And they're simply not. That's why they're finding children there. And what's happening is they've created this fund where they put money into this fund, but who's deciding where the money goes to? Tony Chocolonely is. Why not trust the people who are harvesting the cacao to have their own additional income versus taking some of that income and you decide where it goes? What that feels like, again, is a Western entity making decisions for people in the global South instead because of trusting you know them. Yeah, and I, I clicked through, I mean, to, to, you mentioned the word transparency, but this report, I, I went, Tony Chuckle only, and you've got find out more here because it's on your list of, no, we don't recommend this this company, so find out more. And, I, you know, you look into what's well, just over, maybe even talk about the gate price, what that is, but it's around just over $3,000, I think, and Tony Chuckle only are paying at least a third less, I think. Um, I've probably got it up. I could bring yeah, it up on the screen. But but um, I guess what is that gate price? Why is it important? And not I guess not e even only that. Fair trade price is, is a good bit below maybe $500 or something. So even that, that price that I guess I'm looking at it and reading the report and going, this is about living, you know, a living wage for people that are producing that we're not even getting to that that that's a minimum it's not it's the first rung on the ladder it shouldn't it shouldn't be it's not a luxury it's not a privilege it's a it's the first rung yeah and it's the thing is these prices fluctuate right and so is that how they would treat their employees in the corporate office well prices went down we're going to lower your salary for a bit oh now we're going to raise it why are people in western africa being treated any different well we know why right i mean racism um, so, and they know they can profit whatever they can, but when these companies aren't adjusting their own employees salaries, like they're trying to employ, do it to the ones who are actually doing the, the harvesting, who are doing the actual work that the profits are coming from, that's a problem in my mind. And maybe, you know, people try to act like, oh, I'm being, that's too radical of a thought, but I don't know how that's too radical of a thought, you know, to think that if you're not changing these salaries, why would you change these, their yeah. pay? I think that we, we've all gone through this. I mean, we're seeing it. I heard, you know, the, the price of oil with Ukraine and, you know, imminent, imminent war, I guess. Uh, th this will probably be coming out a couple of, a couple of months um, time. So let's hope that doesn't come to anything. But oil prices, highs has been um, when it's a natural resource that we rely on and there's fluctuation on supply and demand and price goes up. That That's one thing. The price of like, someone that's able to work a full day and put food on their own table and eat and you know go out and be educated that's something completely different that isn't a barrel of oil it's not a you know the price of timber or steel this is talking about a human's life so i think you know to, to your point it doesn't feel too radical because it's completely different we are we we are all humans we should all have at least a minimum standard of you know, uh, of, of living. And it does seem that that is, you know, at the expense of a lot of the luxuries that we have in the West. Yeah. Absolutely. And I was just going to dive in there as well, because you mentioned about, would it fluctuate? Are you being too radical? And actually, maybe for these times, it seems radical. But like I say, my daughter's years or generations to come, it won't seem radical. But radical. Mm -hmm. People will look back in history and say we can't. The same way we look back in racism and how we treated people with slaves and everything else. It's not going to be looking at child slavery and what we do. You've seen it with the coffee. I know you look at coffee as well. What happens with the coffee as well? So I think that the downside is that my my my, my daughter and generations to come just now are taking these things at face value. It's like they look at the fair trade mark and everything else, but it takes organisations like yourself to peel back the curtain. To say, in fact, you know what, there's more to this that meets the eye, the gate price or whatever else. So I think it's not radical. It seems radical just now, but in years to come, you'll be commemorated even further. Because I even seen you won an award, was it? Uh, the Shining World Compassion Award, is that right? Yes. So, so, what, so what exactly is that award? 
Um, it's an award from, um, <laughs> they're, they're called Supreme Master, um, but they're, I think they're a type of religion, um, but she also promotes veganism and social justice. So it was an award from her. Okay. Yeah. Because that, that shows that your purpose, I guess, and we're going to go slightly back off topic. Sorry, I want to just talk around how did you get into all of this in the start? What really drove you forward from a very early doors to actually feel that you wanted to lead this life and feel that you're being radical and feeling that you can't be in charge of a company and then step back because maybe you are a bit too radical? What really pushed you on? Was it an influence at an early age or was it some traumatic experience that made you become vegan? What happened? Um, so I would say that it's, it seems really weird, but I kind of, I think I've always been this way. My, you know, in terms of going vegetarian, um, my parents got divorced when I was young, about four. And um, growing up in Texas and seeing the cows, I always thought like, how horrible would it be for a mama cow to not have her baby or her baby not to have her mama? And I just, you know, that to me was the ants that I saw. It was every being that I saw. I didn't want to be responsible for separating a family. It just, it was too painful. And um, so I went vegetarian when I was in, in elementary school, wasn't able to stick with it because we didn't have a lot of money. Um, but by the time I was 16, I was pretty much like, I'm eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches every day. I'm never eating another animal. And then when I was 17 in 1987, I learned about animal rights and there was no turning back. But during this time as well was when apartheid was going on still in South Africa. And, you know, I just thought, I, ironically, I found that one of the things they were asking people to do to not support the regime was to boycott certain products and not buy Coca-Cola, not buy, and I thought that's something I can do. I was a teenager. I, my mom raised me with an understanding of the great boycott, which was in California in the 19th, well, actually all over the U.S., but to support farm worker justice. Yeah, I'm Mexican, so kind of really part of my family protecting our people. And so I think that all of that, and then, you know, just high school and college and like, you know, supporting social justice issues and being an animal rights activist. And it's just always been part of who I am, you know? Um, and it's kind of annoying sometimes, admittedly, because I'm like, ah, so many people just live their lives not thinking about any of this, whereas I feel like a constant responsibility. Um, but then, you know, I did animal rights. And in 2006, I spoke at the World Social Forum in Caracas, Venezuela, where I just felt at home, I felt empowered. There are people who looked like me. The animal rights vegan movement in the US is very white. It's changing a little bit now, but I felt I've always felt really out of place and alone. And here I was with people who cared about workers' rights, who cared about immigration, who cared about the water, who cared about the rainforest. And I realized I couldn't just do animal rights anymore, um, which is why I started Food Empowerment Project, knowing I couldn't be the only one that cared about animal rights and human rights. Um, so yeah, started the organization in 2006 and then not until 2013 did I start doing it full time. Um, and then yeah, in 20, you know, like this is how bad it was y'all that I say y'all cause I'm from Texas. Um, <laughs> but like, I was like, you know what? I don't want the food empowerment project to sell merchandise anymore. That's part of capital capitalism. I don't want us to sell merchandise. And then we have all these people complaining to us because they're like, I want your merchandise. I want a shirt. And I'm like, I'm anti-capitalist. And then all of a sudden, like, I'm like, I can't do this ED thing anymore. Cause like, I'm not helping the organization grow. I'm not, you I've know. Seen, I've seen, I don't want to say, I've seen the tote bags. So I don't want to say that. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I mean, there was, there's something in that, um, Lauren, that, I was going to ask, and I'm glad that you you called that out, and you, because you touched on it earlier about stepping back and kind of so that you can play the role in the organisation that you actually want and thrive in. Do you ever kind of play this on your mind around, I guess, the sacrifices? Chris, you mentioned the company you work with, but it's with the unfortunate name Satan, but um, it's too close to Satan for me. But oh, it's, good. Uh, <laughs> named, it's called Satan's Law. It's named after the the famous movie. Uh, okay. okay. Um, there you go but it, yeah I guess this conflict between the sacrifices required for growth and scale and and therefore helping more people helping more farmers helping more people move to veganism helping more um, you know areas of you know class and social injustice allow to be make the choices that I guess most in the western world can make do you ever kind of sit and go yeah, maybe should have 
you know, gone faster or gone bigger or, you know, joint ventured with some companies to, um, to do things slightly differently? It is, I will say that it's been hard watching organizations that are much, much younger than Food Empowerment Crop Project grow and be so much larger than we are, have a larger staff, have a much bigger budget. Um, but at the end of the day, I have to look at myself in the mirror. And I have to be glad that when a company that tested on animals that offered to give us a ton of money that I said no to, because wow. I'm not going to support you know, I'm not going to be like, oh, but it, I, I can't just, I can't, it's not my right to make that justification to say, but it's going to help food justice issues. It's okay that they test on animals. I can't do that. We can't take money from a company that does things that I think are in violation of, of women's rights either to say, well, I can make that decision. I, I don't feel like I can. And I know that it's hard um, for the organization. Sometimes I'll have to be like, don't tell me or know that I'm going to give you my opinion, right? You know, and I think that more than not, it's it's having faith in the people that we hire. They're going to keep those values for the organization. Um, and there's always lessons learned as well. I say that the values are really strong. So obviously I work in brands, so look at values and it's against racism, sexism, transphobia, ageism, like really strong values. So you can see that any person that's going to be joining your tribe, your mission, is really going to have that intrinsically in built. So I can imagine if you were to say, well, in fact, we've done a bit of research and this, this company wants to give us money. It's actually tested on animals previously, but they're up against something. You'd imagine that nine times out of 10, you'd hear the answer no. Then maybe the odd person might go, well, do you know what? This could help our trajectory go a bit faster. But at the same time, what you can see is, I guess from your organisation, it always takes a brave organisation to kind of step out of line and go, I'm against this. And then others can just fall in your, in your stride, which is what I guess you've given people the opportunity to do. And sometimes you bury a bit deeper, you might find misgivings from the other companies. But I, I'm I am empowered by what you're doing as well, which is fantastic. It's 17 years, sorry, 15 years, your anniversary, is that right as well? 15 year, yep. That, that is tremendous. To look at the highlights that Darren said about the 2021 achievements, and that's just one year. You look at what you've achieved in that period, it's quite astronomical. You could, I guess, could you have imagined what you could have done back then, what you've done now? No. No, I, cause I really, you know, when we started out, I had a, you know, full-time job up until 2013, a job that I loved. And I really thought, you know, maybe we'll hire somebody to do this and I'll pay them out of my paycheck, you know, just like, that's fine. And the demand on the organization just increased so much that I was not a very nice person because I was working a full-time job, plus basically running food empowerment project full-time. And um, so, no, at the time, I just, I didn't think, I didn't think we'd be hiring people, but what ended up happening, to be honest, is that I have so many ideas on things that I want to do, that it's impossible for us to be able to do them all without having more people, because <laughs> I, I can't burn everybody out, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, I, listen, I, I, I was smiling right the way through, you were talking about, you know, integrity is the word that came to mind, just shine right through, and even even though you've kind of, you say, you know, it was just you, you were working full-time job for the first half of the business has been in, been in place. And I know it feels like it's really starting to gather momentum um, just now. And you've, you've even taken that step back so that you, you play, a, you play a different role. It's fantastic that you've stuck to those principles because it, it, it gives me a load of satisfaction to say there's still people like you in the world and gives me, gives me a lot more faith in humanity um so yeah i guess thank you for thank you for for being for being you and kind of and following your own path and yeah like you said you've seen younger companies go a bit faster but faster doesn't always feel right um i was wanting to ask you about what your thoughts on tony chuckle only i think i probably know the answer but the fact that I, like i'm seeing them everywhere now i was on their website they're now in tesco is a big big employer out here in the in, in UK, I think they tried it over at your neck of the woods. I'm not sure how that went down. Um, yeah, but uh, but yeah, they they're obviously growing and more visible. And I guess a question I'm curious is about, curious about is when I listen to them and look at their website and their values, I go right. I'm bought in. I really like what you're doing. And even you've said the transparency there. They're maybe not going fully in the direction or fully doing the role that they should be doing. And 
but it feels like they're trying to. And I guess I'm just curious to get your opinion on, you know, I guess to, to what extent them or other other firms that are trying to have some social, you know, conscious, like there's some companies where it's right at the whole, the core of what, who they are as a, as a business. Whereas there's, we know the ones who it's like tagged on as, as something that they'll do just because it's because uh, it's popular and it'll be good for shareholders. What's your feeling around, I guess, Tony Chuckle only similar type firms that are trying to move in the right direction, but are, you know, are maybe not fully getting it right? Like, do you trust that they're, they're going to get it right in the, in the future? And, um, or is it, is it something that they're already corrupted in the sense that they've, they're, they're, um, they're chasing the, they're chasing the shareholders, they're chasing the profits? a great great way of putting that because i think that that's something i've struggled with with tony's is like how much is it how much are they now trying to convince themselves that they're still that company and how much an ngo and they've taken a different they've taken a different route they're they're you know private company they're so they're you know their profits they, they, they need to make profit yep yeah. And if you, I mean, I've read their annual reports and they're kind of odd, um, you know, and again, I give them high marks for transparency, but I just don't know how much they're living up to what they think that they are and how much they're trying to convince themselves and convince everybody else at this point, because part of their supply chain is, um, I believe, Barry Calibut, um, which is a not great company. And they're, they're still, because they want to grow so fast, I think that they have sold out some of the ethics of the company. Um, and I feel like they know the right thing to do, but they're not doing it. And I think that part of this is just to real, in my opinion, is to really do right by what's happening in Western Africa and Brazil now, will take a radical transformation and how this stuff is being done. And I'll tell you, there's one company that's been doing it and what they've been doing in Western Africa is they've actually been helping buy the equipment for the farmers in Western Africa so they can do everything themselves. And that's what's gonna be radical, right? Is, is letting go of some of that power from the West and, and giving it to the people who are actually doing the work. And I think for some companies, that's too scary because their model is still based on typical business capitalism, I would say, um, that we have in the West. And, and it's, it's, I think it's just very scary um, for them because, because of racism, again, to give power to the people in Western Africa. I, I, don't, I don't feel like Tony's really trusts the people in Western Africa. Uh, unfortunately, and I think that that's what would be required is we require to do good in this interest industry is going to require them being in charge in Western Africa, the growers actually being in charge of everything. I think that that sounds like part of it's the governance, isn't it, about them wanting to be completely and utterly in charge. And that's when I think back to that brand I was working with, with the frustrations they were feeling with the supply chain issues. And that's a completely different market, it's the food industry, but they were seeing the, the pain points and they realised that their growth trajectory where they wanted to be was going to take many years to get to that point because of all the things they need to fix. But I think there's something in that about being honest. I mean, there's a brand in the UK, which are actually in America, which is Brewdog. They've had a bit of a PR disaster last year and this year as well in a documentary about their culture and authenticity and leading the right kind of way and it sounds very similar to Tony's Chocolate anyway they've grown so fast that they've got to a point now where they either need to be one thing or another thing but they're kind of in the middle at the moment and you, you can't really play in the middle once an audience starts to know that something isn't fully authentic they'll probably move on and I think that's a danger unfortunately so I think that's fantastic I mean one last thing I was going to just ask before we start to consider wrapping this up or two last things is Obviously, you've celebrated 15 years. Where would you like food empowerment to be in another 15 years? What would you like that trajectory to be for the for the organization? So this is the hardest question for me. <laughs> <laughs> because it's so hard, right? Like I am I am a very literal person. So I'm like, you know, we have a campaign against a grocery store chain for putting restrictive deeds on their former properties and they prevent That's other safe way. Safe it's way. called Safeway and they go by other names out here. Um, but yeah, uh, so I would love for that for that to end because it's really harming the health of communities. So in 15 years, I'd love for there to be more of an understanding of how corporations are impacting the health of communities. I'd love to have um, 
Sorry, Lauren, I must have missed it. What, what, is, what is that one? Can you explain that a little yeah, bit absolutely. more? Is that okay? So, yeah, yeah. So grocery stores um, in the United States have the ability to put what's called restrictive deeds on their former property. And it actually stems from racism in the United States where they would try to prevent Black people from moving into particular neighborhoods. So they'd put restrictive deeds to prevent Black people from moving in. Well, now sure. what they're doing this for is we have grocery store chains in the U.S., that maybe they're in a black brown community and they move from that location, they move a few miles away and they put what's called a restrictive deed on their former property saying no grocery store can move here for X number of years, maybe 15 years, 20 years, 30 years. So that community is deprived of having a grocery store and it impacts the community greatly. Their health deteriorates. Um, people then have to take multiple buses if they don't have cars. Plus, you have them taking multiple buses to get to get groceries, and then you have buses sometimes restricting how many bags of groceries people can take on a bus, right? So it's hurting the health of the community. So I would love in 15 years for us to have made an impact there. When it comes to chocolate, I'd like to see a chocolate company really try to do something different and really, um, you know, and if it's Tony's great, but I, you think that you hit it on the head, Chris, in the sense that they are so desiring to grow so fast. You know, here they are, they're not saying, look, we found children and our and, and where we're growing our cacao, we need to step back and scale back and fix this problem before we grow any bigger, but they're not doing that, right? Um, but I think more than not, I would love to see less of a division between all of these issues that to me are very much connected to where you're not saying, oh, it's the vegan animal rights people. Oh, it's the people working on labor justice issues, environmental issues, racial justice issues, that there's more of an understanding that if we work together and if we're in solidarity together, we, we can make a, a bigger impact. And maybe that's because we need this younger generation, you know, in 15 years, how old will your daughter be, Chris? She will be 23, thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, the crazy Sorry, I, I'm, I'm good at maths, he's good at drawing. <laughs> I was about to say, you were the numbers earlier. I was like, oh gosh, uh, Darren knows the numbers a little bit too well. See, so she, your daughter's going to be 23. That's going to be like amazing, right? Like she's going to be right there with us. And her generation, I think, is just really going to help shift so much of this. So in 15 years, when I think of um, kids like your daughter, I, I, I think Food Empowerment Project is, is going to be maybe more of, um, maybe more recognized for the, the solidarity work that we're building. Especially, I can visualize her with her tote bag on and her t shirt as well. <laughs> ah, no. <laughs> She'll have the one she made herself. <laughs> well, that's it. It's all about empowerment. I love that when you mentioned about the chocolate brand, it's empowering people within their, their culture, with, whether it's Africa, wherever else. And we haven't spoken around coffee. I'm an avid drinker of coffee and I'm starting to educate myself about where coffee comes from. And that's scaring me even further. There was a documentary in the, in the UK about it, the dispatches one, which was shocking, scary. So everything you seem to touch has an impact. So it's been aware of what you bring into your home and into your lives is what I'm becoming aware of, even as I'm getting older, which is quite scary. Yeah, I mean, even simpler, we, we, we never, another thing we never touched on that I'm always curious about is someone mentioned to the other week, they were saying to their son eating a packet of strawberries here in the UK and they're like, why eating strawberries? You know, it's like I don't even know. A South Africa, maybe it's came from. It's like why? What? Why are we? Why are we doing that? You know, the actual impact. And um, he was like, "Oh, well, we can eat strawberries all year round. So why would you not want to eat strawberries all year round?" And I think there may be some unlearning that we want to go from this privileged position to unwind some of that to still have an absolutely incredibly privileged life that you know the, the vast majority of us have in the in the Western world. But, but actually, if we unwind that a little bit, we could make some massive, massive dis like differences in the world and positive change. So, yeah, it's been absolutely amazing, um, I guess, Lauren, having you on. And, you know, it does feel, Chris, that we've barely scratched the surface of this. Um, so we will need to get you on again in the future. I'd love to. And, you know, I love the, the title of your podcast as well. I, you know, yes. Yes, we're going to we sometimes ask guests this, but we think we've kind of covered it. But I'd love to get your views on purpose over profit because I, I think by people just listening to this podcast, they can get the enthusiasm, the energy, and the, the radicalness of your personality, which is fantastic. But what's your views on purpose over profit? What it actually means? Yeah, you know, just your own personal views about what you think purpose over profit means to you personally. 
I think that I, this is so bad, y'all, but I feel like I have a negative opinion of profit. Um, and so I feel like purpose is it always should be over profit. I think that it has to be, we have to have intention behind what we do and um, be answerable, not only to ourselves, but also to every other living being. And I think that sometimes profit doesn't take anything but money into consideration. And I think that that's what's damaged us so much. Wow, that's definitely one of the most insightful answers we've ever had on the podcast. <laughs> so thank you. But Lauren, thank you so much for uh, sharing your time and your morning with us. It's been very insightful. And like Darren says, it'd be fantastic to get you on again. I'm looking forward to finding out more about avocados as well, once that's yes. published on your website as well. That'll be something else I'll now be probably ticking off my list of not to eat for a while. Uh, no, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. It's been fantastic. Uh, thank you both so much. It's been so much fun. And um, I'm hoping to go to Scotland if I can safety wise this year. Maybe I'll, I'll drop you all a line. It'd be great to meet you all in person and maybe meet your daughter. 100%, especially with you all. I love that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Bring your raincoat. That's the only yeah. thing. You'll know that already. Yes. Well, thank you all so much for all that you're doing. And I, it was an honor to be on your show. Thanks, Lauren. As always, thank you so much for listening to the Pop Pod this week. If you'd like to leave a review or share the podcast with others, then that'd be awesome. You'll find us on Instagram at the Pop Pod, and on Facebook we have a community group called Purpose to Progress that anyone can join. And we'll be back every Monday with a new episode, but until then, stay on purpose, and we'll see you next week.